Okay, let's continue with the second lecture on cosmology. All right. Okay, so uh, I usually review the last lecture before I start the next one, but given that it was uh, two hours ago, um, I think I don't, I don't need to review it very thoroughly, but um, so we just quantize the, the free field in the sitter, the free scalar field, and uh, in particular the massless field. And um, so we, I talked about this uh, Mukhanov Sasaki variable. Uh, I'm still confused about this sign here. I'll check it tonight. Uh, but this is for sure correct, this uh, expression down here. And um, so the, the point is that the, the fluctuation phi at late times has a constant value, okay? So this is usually referred to as freeze out of the fluctuation. So this uh, more specifically when k eta is much less than one. So then you can neglect these terms here. This is uh, this uh, time at which um, a mode's uh, uh, physical wavelength becomes comparable to the Hubble scale. This is what this equation is telling you. So when k eta, let me call eta star, when at the time eta star in which a given co-moving mode um, has a physical wavelength equal to the Hubble uh, radius, so one over Hubble, right? Uh, then it's said that this mode crossed the horizon. So because the sitter space has a horizon, so I didn't emphasize this in the first lecture, but if I'm here and here's your friend, at some point into the future, there, there, there will be like a cosmic horizon, which is uh, uh, one Hubble radius away from you. So you lose uh, contact with your friend forever. So you never hear from uh, him or her again, which can be a good thing depending on the situation. But uh, it implies that uh, at some point, uh, things get out of causal contact. So uh, the interesting thing about massless fields in the sitter is that once uh, they cross the horizon, once their physical wavelength becomes uh, uh, re considerably bigger than the, um, the Hubble radius, then uh, the fluctuations freeze out. So keep that in mind. I'll get back to it uh, later. So now the plan for this lecture is to do uh, start inflationary perturbation theory. So this was the end of lecture one. And if I know myself well, I won't get to the end of lecture two, but I hope that I'll do uh, at least half of what I planned for lecture two. Um, I want to go slowly in the beginning because I think that this is uh, the, the thing that is actually being measured and constrained. So it's important that you understand where it comes from. So let me say a few words about inflation. So inflation was a, a theory developed to explain why the universe looks uh, so homogeneous uh, and kind of fine-tuned, given that it, it, has, it has a finite age and uh, different points in the sky never had enough time. If you track backwards their time evolution, they never had enough time to be in causal contact according to standard Big Bang cosmology. But somehow they look exactly the same. The universe looks homogeneous. So either you start the universe in a very special state in which uh, things are fine-tuned or you just extend the lifetime of the universe into the past. And that's what inflation does. So it, it says that the, the, what we used to call the hot Big Bang is actually the surface at, at the end of inflation, usually called the reheating surface. And then we extend uh, time uh, further behind the naive Big Bang singularity. And then during this period of inflation, um, the universe expands uh, at an accelerated pace such a way that the observable patch of the universe was actually tiny, 
uh, at the beginning of inflation. So then it's not a problem to have uh, all, the, all the things we observe right now in causal context. In fact, they were. They were at sub-horizon scales at the beginning of inflation. They get super stretched during this accelerated expansion. And then because uh, the later universe uh, doesn't expand as fast as during inflation, then these fluctuations re-enter our horizon. Okay? So these are the things that are being probed uh, by the cosmic microwave background, uh, radiation experiments, or large-scale structure surveys, and so on. Um, inflation, so let's see. So I would say that inflation is, is a, a period of accelerated expansion of the universe. Pre-Big Bang. Pre, like, uh, the, the usual hot Big Bang. Uh, so it explains why the universe looks so flat, so, so homogeneous, because it was just tiny, uh, a tiny patch at the beginning of inflation. It gets stretched out. Okay. Uh, but as I said, there's the, the beautiful bonus, and that's, uh, I think, probably the main reason why people, cosmologists, uh, tend to believe that something like, like inflation actually happened happened in the early universe. The fantastic bonus is that it explains um, where the seeds of structure formation come from. They come from particle production. Or quantum fluctuations. In the, in the inflationary era. So the purpose of this lecture is to explain how these quantum fluctuations are generated. Okay. So to first approximation, uh, inflation uh, is well described by uh, the Sitter phase of the universe. But of course, uh, uh, this uh, inflationary period has to stop. Okay. So it can't be eternal, the Sitter space. So you need to stop it somehow. And uh, the way we do it is uh, by hand. So we create. We have a scalar field that is like an order parameter or a clock that essentially tells me how long inflation will last at each point in space. Okay, so this clock uh, field uh, has some vacuum energy, and this vacuum energy is responsible for the local cosmological constants. And as this clock field evolves, the 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 um, the specific value of the cosmological constant at each point changes, and it's important that it's decaying. So the H dot is negative, so the effective Hubble parameter is decreasing with time. And um, that's it. So in, in this way, by postulating the existence of a, of a order parameter or a clock field, then I can have a, a period that looks approximately like the Sitter space, but then slowly uh, uh, matches into like a more standard Big Bang cosmology. The things that we actually measure, uh, so, okay, so it's important that uh, inflation lasts for long enough to homogenize the universe. So there's some uh, requirements on the number of times that uh, it, it uh, duplicates the, the distance. If you, if you take some uh, distance and you wait for a long enough time, or their Hubble, then uh, the distance uh, gets uh, doubled. And uh, then you have to wait a certain amount of time. You have to wait around 60 E folds. Actually, the amount of times it takes to multiply by E, the distance. Then if you wait this, uh, this long, then the universe will 
if you start from a tiny enough patch, then the universe will look uh, 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 flat enough and you remove these fine tuning problems. The things that we actually probe in the CMB are just coming from a few of those uh, E folds because they are modes that get stretched uh, to very long distances and then they re enter the horizon, but, but they are not uh, super short scales. They are still big enough distance scales that we can resolve them in the CMB. So, for all practical purposes, um, we need to study the sitter space with a, a few uh, tweaks to, to the background in order to take into account the facts that the, it's not quite the sitter space. The, the effective cosmological constant is uh, decaying with time. So let me um, describe how this works. So the approximate background space time is this sitter. So that's why I spent so much time describing the sitter space because uh, we will essentially use the same tools of quant uh, canonical quantization in the sitter to study the fluctuations in inflation. Uh, but it's approximate, so we need to understand uh, how this approximation works and where things change. Uh, as I said, we need a clock. So. some order parameter that tracks the duration of inflation. So I start at every point in space, things start expanding exponentially like they would in the sitter, but uh, uh, then I have a clock field that at each, uh, each position has a slightly different value, so the duration of inflation is a little bit longer here compared to there, and it's essentially these uh, delays. Even if I synchronize all the clocks in the beginning, there will be just from quantum fluctuations slight delays between uh, a clock here and a clock there. And because uh, inflation lasts a little bit longer here compared to there, even if I start from a flat surface, the surface will be curved in the end, just because there was a little bit more time for space to expand here compared to there. And it, it, that's essentially the physics of what produces these quantum fluctuations. Okay? Just the fact that even if I start with pure the sitter, uh, like the little jitters of this field uh, cannot be the same everywhere. So they're described by quantum mechanics. So there will be some statistics of how long inflation lasts uh, for each history, for each point, each geodesics, if you wish, that I track. And then uh, if I start with a flat surface, I'll have a, a slightly curved surface. And these are the curvature fluctuations that later when they, they are super stretched, so then the, the horizon at some point catches up with them and when they re-enter the horizon, then they induce gravitational clustering. And then they will form galaxies and structure and things like that. Okay? So, inflation is, I like to say, I don't know that it's a very popular way of saying it, but I like to say that it's kind of Landau-Ginsburg theory of this clock field. So it's some order parameter. We don't know where it comes from. Uh, from a microscopic perspective, there is a whole field of string inflation that tries to say that it comes from some axion or some uh, uh, microscopic field. But uh, I, I think it's fair to say that we don't know where it comes from, but we are effective field theorists. We're like doing Landau theory. We're just writing a theory for this order parameter. And then, uh, so this is a simple guess. And for this guess, you, you can actually describe more or less everything that is observed. So this is the action for the theory. So it's a gravitational theory. So I, I need the Einstein-Hilbert term. And then I, the, the field is just a scalar field. So, oops, I'm just writing uh, gravity plus some scalar field some, with a potential. So the potential is important and in a sense, uh, 
people play games with uh, shapes of the potential, whether it's fine-tuned or not. Uh, the potential is very important because it, it tells you what is the, what is the typical history of, uh, of an inflationary trajectory. So let me, write, uh, let me show you in a picture. So I'll just draw a, a random example. So if I start, uh, if the field starts its life up here and it doesn't have a, a, a high speed, so I give you some uh, vacuum expectation value and I give you some uh, sp initial speed that is not too large, then uh, the potential energy uh, essentially drives uh, 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 expansions, and I have uh, approximately the sitter solution. And then, of course, because it's a, it's, it, it has a potential like this, the, the expectation value of the field will slowly roll down. And at some point, then uh, the description as a quasi-de-sitter space will fail. Okay? And this is when we say inflation is over. And then uh, there is a whole theory for analyzing what happens once it's here at the bottom of the potential and so on. We won't get, uh, we won't talk about this. We're essentially just interested in this region here when the field is uh, roughly described by the sitter space, but I, I'm taking into account the fact that it's slowly rolling down the slope. It can also be here in this region, it's kind of flat, and it's slowly rolling down the, to the bottom. Once I hit the bottom, then uh, the, the vacuum energy is very small. It can't drive a, a cosmological expansion. So I have to fine tune, if you wish, the initial conditions of the field in such a way that I'm already um, at a phase of expansion. Okay. So this is the fact that it's slowly rolling. It's called, uh, as you can imagine, the slow roll approximation. And um, this means the following, that the potential energy, so the amount of energy deposited in the potential energy is much bigger than the kinetic energy. At some point, this ceases to be true. When this ceases to be true, we say that uh, inflation is over. Okay. So uh, did I write this down? Oh, yeah, let me write the Friedman equation for this, um, for this uh, action here. So this is all classical field theory. So the, the metric is some FRW. Ah, this is just uh, some random uh, example. You can do m squared phi squared even. It's ruled out, but you can do it. Uh, it produces too many gravitational waves. But in principle, as long as you have a potential that uh, for which uh, this low row condition can be attained, that I'll write down the board, and you start uh, high, high up enough that there is enough uh, the sitter like uh, expansion, then you're good. The, the theory of where this potential comes from is a whole field right? in cosmology. In fact, to, to keep this uh, in, under control in effective field theory, is, uh, is a challenge, especially if we ever see tensors. So the last lecture, I'll talk about gravitational waves generated during inflation. And if we see them in the next 10 years, it implies that this field had to roll uh, a distance in field space that is Planckian. So from the point of view of effective field theory, it looks very dangerous because then you have to trust this potential to very high orders in phi over m Planck. And uh, I think we have no mechanism to to keep this under control. But uh, right now, just uh, take it as God-given. In fact, I'll forget where the potential comes from in a little bit. I'm just worried. In a sense, we can't really probe the, the actual potential. We only care about the theory of the fluctuations. Yeah, because slow roll, um, there are ways of inflating without a uh, slow roll, but this gives me uh, good analytic control over the theory of the fluctuations, and then I, uh, 
I know what I'm doing. It's just uh, the easiest way to describe uh, inflationary fluctuations. I, I need some period of a quasi decider expansion. If it's not uh, quite slow roll, then I need uh, some other mechanism to have this quasi decider. So the point of slow roll is just that it is quasi decider, so that if I start from decider, it remains decider for, for quite a while. I'm, I'm just uh, uh, assuming that it's, uh, I have an FRW solution and um, that the field phi, as I said, it's a clock. So I'm actually gonna, uh, it, has a, it has a VEV, or well, it's bad to say VEV because we're doing classical field theory, but it has a, uh, a value that only depends on time. Yeah? So this is actually a choice of gauge. So I'm choosing, because it's gravity, I have a, a gauge freedom, and I'm picking a gauge in which uh, uh, constant uh, time slices have a constant value of phi, okay? And uh, so this is the background solution, or the ansatz. You could start with uh, jittery backgrounds or, or backgrounds that have like, uh, are not quite constant in time, and then people show that this is kind of an attractor solution, that if I start slightly away from this, and if I wait a little bit of time, it will eventually start tracking this solution here. Okay, so th let's just start from using these ansatz. Then the Friedman equation will, will be this. So these are, these are the Friedman equations. And um, the slow row approximation is the following. Let's um, define this parameter here, epsilon. It's called the first slow row parameter. Uh, like this, so it's dimensionless, like this. And if you just uh, plug this thing in, under the, under the condition that the potential energy is much bigger than the kinetic energy, then I will get phi bar dot squared over two divided by Planck squared h squared, okay? Which is just related to the potential. So it, roughly speaking, it's like kinetic energy divided by potential energy. And there's another slow row parameter, eta. That I also want to be small for. So I, I want kind of the first and the second derivatives of the Hubble parameter to be small in some quantifiable way. So these are called the uh, slow row conditions. Uh, when uh, epsilon equals to one, then I declare the end of inflation. And of course, when epsilon is very small, when epsilon equals to zero, then uh, h dot is zero, then I have the sitter. Is the background. So that's why uh, I'm, using the fact that epsilon is very small, I will approximate that I could do the calculation in the sitter, and at the very end, I'll take into account that there is a non-zero epsilon, and it will create some uh, small difference uh, compared to the sitter result. Okay. So uh, notice that the kinetic term gives me the time evolution of the Hubble parameter, while the potential term gives me the size of it. So, the slow row approximation is just the fact the potential dominates over kinetic, uh, and then this, in the end, it's really s slowly rolling because it's moving slowly, okay? So that's the approximation. It's useful for, for doing computations. And it's also useful to ensure that the background solution is really, can be really approximated by the sitter space. 
All right, I ah, forgot to say, uh, M Planck squared is, this is just, uh, it's related to G Newton like this. So if you would rather use G Newton, this is the definition. Okay, now what are the, what are the fields? If now I want to quantize, so I describe the background, and now I want to quantize this theory. So the point is that uh, on top of this background solution, there will be quantum fluctuations. So it's what I was saying, that there is a, a solution that is a classical, and every point will, in principle, track the solution. But quantum fluctuations will make it in such a way that at point x1, the tracking is a little bit different than at point x2. And because there are relative delays of this clock field, it means that at point x1, there was more time for the universe to inflate compared to point x2. And at the end of the day, even though I started with a flat surface, I'll end up with a curved surface. That's the, that's the point, okay? This is how uh, uh, inflation generates, uh, the quantum fluctuations of inflation will generate the curvature fluctuations that, we'll measure, that we measure in the CMB and large scale structure. So now I want to do the quantum theory. So this was, this was all the classical theory. There is nothing about quantum mechanics. And then I want to quantize this theory. So how many degrees of freedom uh, will, I, will I have in the quantum theory? It'll be three. There'll be two from the graviton. So there'll be two gravitational wave degrees of freedom and one from the scalar. Okay? Because this is a gauge theory, I have to choose a gauge. Uh, it means that I can pick coordinates in a certain way. And uh, a convenient gauge that makes, um, makes uh, this computation closer to the things that we actually measure is the following. It's, to, it's, to, it's a sort of uh, Higgs mechanism. I'm going to eat the scalar fluctuations into the metric. So the metric will become a fat graviton. So it will carry three degrees of freedom. Uh, the two standard tensor ones, but it also, because of this VEV here, it, I can also eat it into the, into the metric fluctuations. There will be a metric fluctuation that is a scalar, of scalar type, some monopole type of fluctuation that is not allowed in GR, but here in uh, inflation is okay. Is that clear? Yes, it's a choice of gauge, but the, here it's an assumption for what, uh, what classical solution. There are other classical solutions uh, in which uh, you, you could imagine forming caustics. It's not clear that it's a good uh, solution everywhere. But uh, this is so-called attractor solution. So pretty much uh, most uh, in the space of initial conditions, they, they will converge into this solution, which uh, phi only depends on time. Yeah, then at the, uh, if I wait long enough, you will uh, asymptotically converge to something that looks like this. So this is done, uh, I'm not gonna do this because it's uh, about the classical uh, theory, but if you want to see this in detail, it's done in, um, in a beautiful review. It's Brandenberger, Feldman, Mukhanov. I think it's 92. So they analyze the phase space and they show that this is an attractor solution for the classical uh, theory. So it's, it, they do the quantum theory also, but the, the analysis of the classical theory is done very nicely in this paper. But the, uh, that's the claim. So I'm just uh, describing the actual background that, uh, in which we're going to compute the fluctuations. Yeah, the gradients will be yeah the gradients will be switched off, and then uh, at uh, late times it will, or at uh, early and after a certain amount of time, it will just be morally equivalent to the solution that I'm describing here. <laughs> 
No, I don't think it's in general. Yeah, it, there, it's it's something to do with the fact that the asymptotics of this uh, is uh, the asymptotics of a quasi-decider uh, universe. So it's not for any dynamical system. This will be possible. So there is some uh, assumption that uh, the late time dynamics is uh, roughly of the decider space. And then in the decider space, the intuition is that everything gets red shifted. So the only thing that uh, survives is kind of the zero mode of the field. And all the, all the Fourier modes, if you start with phi t and x, all the Fourier modes are getting washed out over time. That's the, that's the intuition. So it's not, if you were to do this in flat space, you wouldn't be an attractor attractor solution. And if I were to start like here at the bottom. So, so there is some uh, basing of attraction. Of course, so it's not random initial conditions. That, so people argue whether this uh, is enough. Uh, so there's the question of whether inflation is fine-tuned or not. But yeah. I, so uh, yeah. Does that answer your question? Or? Yeah, the initial condition problems in inflation, depending on who you ask, they'll say uh, it's not solved or it is solved. Uh, I'm going to be agnostic about where the background comes from. I'm going to study the fluctuations because this is what we actually probe in experiments. And, uh, and, yeah. and I think that if I, if I follow my nose with these uh, simple uh, uh, ansatz, somehow I, I get things that seem to be what we see in the data. So. Yeah. We're going to do this right now. We're going to make the metric fluctuate. Yeah. Are you worried about the normalizability of gravity, or everything we're going to do is three levels, so there's no problem? We're going to quantize the theory, meaning we're going to uh, promote the metric and phi to operators. But it's quantum field theory in a fixed background. So we describe the background solution, and then we're going to do perturbation theory, small quantum fluctuations on top of the background. So we're going to assume that the background was, uh, was a quasi-decider, and they are going to have uh, small gravitational waves on top of the decider background. It's not that the full metric is going to wildly fluctuate. All right. Yeah, this is important because this is actually the only thing that we constrain with data at the moment. So I'm happy to to spend more time here. All right. So let's quantize this theory. Um, So there is a choice of gauge that will look like this. So it's called uh, it's called co-moving co gauge. In co-moving gauge, the field phi that will now depend on t and x. Phi bar of t. So in principle, you could add a small fluctuation on top of it. But as I said, I'm going to Higgs it. So I'm going to eat this uh, uh, fluctuation. So I'm going to keep it. Uh, so it's a choice of uh, uh, time coordinates. And now the metric fluctuations, um, maybe let me write it like this first, and then I'll explain it more carefully. This is a bit of a technical part, but it's crucial for what comes next. So. So I'm just doing the spatial part of the metric here. Forget about the dt squared for a second. A squared, it would be just A squared delta ij, but now I'm going to write it like this, 2 zeta times delta ij plus gamma ij. So if I were to do just gravitational waves, I would uh, just get the gamma ij. So this gamma ij is a, is a uh, three by three matrix that has uh, 
by a choice of uh, spatial coordinates is such that I gamma IG. So I, I can pick a gauge in which it's traceless and transverse, such a way that I have just two uh, independent degrees of freedom. So now I have the, the three degrees of freedom are zeta and x. I'm sorry, I should have made this clear. And gamma ij. I chose the time coordinates by. But, but you already chose a set of No, no, that, that's a, that's the attractor solution. So, yeah. Well, but I'm I'm doing uh, I'm doing also the yeah I'm doing the quantum theory. So I'm I'm just saying that uh, I can still I can still still do time reparameterizations of this uh, of this guy here, and um, I can make this time reparameterizations space dependent. To eat the fluctuation of of phi. It's not. This is the metric. The zeta fluctu the zeta fluctuation is precisely this. Uh, so this, if I were to write it like this, phi x. I'm just saying that I can set this to zero, but then it reappears here. There are three degrees of freedom, right? They have to be somewhere. Uh, I'll get to the, I said forget about the T squared for a second. I'll, 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 I'm doing just the spatial metric, okay? Uh, and I, I'm saying that I, I can choose a gauge in which this guy here is zero, okay? This is a choice of gauge. Uh, now let me, let, so from the point of view of degrees of freedom, I'm doing nothing wrong because all the degrees of freedom are here. Uh, as a, you'll see in a second, the fact that the VEV exists uh, is crucial in order to go to this gauge. Okay, it's like going to unitary gauge uh, in the Higgs mechanism. So I have the right number of degrees of freedom. And now I have to tell you how the full metric looks like. And now you understand why I'm doing it like this. So. So the full metric, this is called the, or it even has a special name, so let me, so this is called the ADM decomposition of the metric. Uh, ADM stands for Arnovitz, Dezer, and Meisner. Uh, so it's a three plus one splitting of the metric. So the metric is written as follows. Ah, let me make it explicit. N of t and x squared plus vij x times uh, ni plus that dxi times nj So I think that now I'm ready to answer your question. So the the whole point is that gravity is a theory with constraints. So the the point let's uh, do electromagnetism for a second. So the, the I I have to specify some uh, potential but uh, electromagnetic potential, but I have to satisfy Gauss's law, so I can't specify some random four potential. And uh, the way that this is enforced in the Lagrange is that there's a Lagrange multiplier, right? A, the zero component of the gauge potential, right? It doesn't have a kinetic term, it's not a degree of freedom, it's just enforcing a constraint, that is the Gauss laws constraint. The same thing happens in GR, and uh, the way to see it uh, most obviously is using this decomposition here, okay? 
So this is the true degree of freedom that I can specify, is this three metric here. And if I, uh, oh, I think I made, maybe it's squared here. And now if I, um, if I plug these ansatz into the Einstein equation, so this is just an ansatz for the metric, any metric can be put in this form. But now if I plug in the, these ansatz for the Einstein equation, this guy and these guys don't have kinetic terms. So they're constrained, okay? So they're just like the A naught component of the electromagnetic field. So the, the point is that um, N, N, and I, they have names, actually N is called the laps, because it tells me uh, at every point in time uh, how the fluctuation affects the, the clock at every, uh, at every point in time because it's changing the way I'm measuring time. And Ni is called the shift because it, it tells me that every moment in time my coordinate system is getting slightly deformed in a certain direction. Actually, if you look at the, the phone book, the Misner Thorn Wheeler, uh, textbook on gravity, they have some nice picture uh, with the intuition behind this. It's like They take like two slices of space time and they glue them with rods and clocks and uh, try to interpret these uh, lapse and shift functions. So the point is that I am free to specify G, I, J, okay? And then uh, the lapse and the shift are gonna be functions of G, I, J. I have to solve for them and plug them back into the action. It would be like doing electrodynamics in the Coulomb gauge. So it is true, as uh, you were asking, the, um, this is not gonna be the metric anymore. So once the fluctuations are uh, enter the game, then I have to specify G, I, J, and then I have to solve for N and N, I. So the metric will be much more complicated as a function of these fluctuations. But this has the right number of degrees of freedom. The only thing I did uh, up to now was to pick a, a time coordinates in such a way that, that uh, the zeta variable is appearing here and um, picking spatial coordinates to enforce that this gamma ij is transverse traceless. So I used my gauge freedom. Okay. But I still have the, to solve the constraints. So that's how I, I go from, uh, from the 10 components of the metric down to two gravitons, right? I have four gauge choices, but I have four constraints. So those are eight equations that lend me at uh, two degrees of freedom. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so, uh, the point is that there's some physical observable that is the curvature. So the, the, the physical observable are curvature fluctuations, okay? And uh, these curvature fluctuations are largely parameterized by gradients of these uh, guys here. Okay? And uh, there is a nice, there, there is a simple way of relating these to things like temperature fluctuations in the CMB. Okay, so that's why I'm uh, going through the pain of describing these guys here. But I agree we're not done with, uh, with the computation when we just describe these things. So we do things up to the end of inflation and then our uh, more uh, uh, practical cosmologist, cosmologist friends, they have to, to take these zeta and gammas, turn them into actual temperature fluctuations and evolve them up to now. So you have to pick a frame uh, with respect to which the, the CMB will look static and that picks like a, a time coordinates, and then uh, the statistics of these uh, zeta and gamma fluctuations are with respect to this uh, frame in which the CMB looks at rest. So that's, uh... but roughly speaking, this zeta here is, so very roughly speaking, you can relate zeta to uh, the temperature fluctuations in the CMB. Okay, so that's why it's a nice variable. It's a nice variable for two reasons. Reason number one is that uh, as I showed you and I erased, uh, the, remember the, the massless scalar field at late times, the fluctuations freeze out. So these zeta fluctuations, they also freeze out. And when they re-enter the horizon, they're precisely sourcing the, the temperature anisotropies in the CMB. So we uh, correlate uh, 
more or less, it's almost an equality up to factors and so on. We correlate the anisotropies in the CMB temperature. So delta T is the temperature at a spot with respect to the mean. Um, and we correlate this thing to zeta. One other thing that I, I should say is that uh, zeta kind of uh, generates all um, anisotropies. So the anisotropies in dark matter and all the fluids in the universe, they're all related to the same zeta variable. So this, this is why these are also called adiabatic fluctuations. So different fluids in the universe, not... So this is, uh, of course, sourcing photon uh, fluctuations, but there are other fluids in the universe. And uh, somehow, all of the fluctuations are sourced by the same field. And this is a sort of interesting uh, fact. And uh, also makes it uh, easy to rule out a bunch of models of inflation. Because if you have other things floating around and they start coupling differently to the other fluids, then we wouldn't see this adiabaticity of the fluctuations. So. OK. All right. Uh, so, this was a, a lot of work, but the actual final result is very simple. Uh, so, what is, the, what is the game? Now, if you uh, trust me and uh, trust in these ansatz, it has the right number of degrees of freedom. And it's actually easy to show that if I change the time coordinates, I can eat this thing back. I can just remove this guy and it will reappear here. And there is some simple equation that relates phi to zeta. Okay, so the number of degrees of freedom is conserved. But now if I take this ansatz and plug it in that action and expand to quadratic order, then I'll, I'll get the answer that uh, I'll show it to you in a second. A uh, bit of a hard problem is to solve for n and ni also, because there, there will be algebraic equations uh, more, more like time independent equations, constraint equations that these two guys satisfy and I have to solve for them perturbatively and then feed them back into the action. So that's, uh, that's actually complicated, but uh, I'll just spare you the, the work and tell you the answer because the answer is very simple. So the action for the zeta variable, I'm just expanding to quadratic order, okay? It's gonna be given by um, epsilon a cubed, some M Planck squared here, doesn't matter. Zeta dot squared minus a di zeta. So that's it. So after all of this work, this is what you get. And now if I forget about uh, the fact that epsilon is time dependent, uh, and uh, I plug in the A for uh, the sitter space, this is just a free field in the sitter space. <laughs> okay? So that's, uh, that's why I was emphasizing so much the sitter. So this is a small number. And uh, we're going to take it to be constant at the level uh, of approximation that we care about. And then this A we're going to take is approximately the Sitter uh, scale factor. This is just uh, M Planck squared epsilon root G. So that's it on minus sign. And for the graviton, other than the prefactor, the story is the same. Actually, historically, it's sort of interesting. So Starobinsky uh, uh, wrote down this answer and wrote down the two-point function for the graviton. 1979, but the goof's inflation is from the early 80s. So, but uh, usually when we talk about primordial gravitational waves, we reference Tarobinsky's paper. Uh, so I don't think he had the inflation in the back of uh, 
of his mind, but uh, he was already studying gravitational waves in uh, expanding cosmology. And he showed uh, well, what I'm going to show you in a second, so let me not spoil it. So this is uh, essentially each, uh, so each polarization mode of the graviton behaves as a free field in the sitter space. So in the end, after all this work, the hard work is to actually get the factors uh, here, the, the epsilon, the one over eight, and it, it looks uh, hopeless in the middle, but in the end you get just a free field theory. Um, actually, you should, other than the factor of epsilon, you should have guessed that the actions have to be massless. Can you tell me why? This is a cute puzzle. You, I mean, it's a quadratic action, so I mean, other than this, you, you, you could have added a mass term, you could have uh, created a sound speed, but okay, forget about it. Why is there no mass term? There's, there's no mass term because uh, mass term breaks shift symmetry, and if I shift zeta or gamma, uh, then I can uh, undo the shift by coordinate uh, transformation. So it, that's why there's no, there's no mass term. So the, the difficulty is in getting the factors, but the factor is crucial. It actually uh, explains in a way why we're seeing scalar fluctuations and not seeing gravitational fluctuations yet. So now let's compute the power. You will see at cubic order. But once you put them in a loop and you compute the loop, you won't induce a mass term. That's the at quadratic level, they don't mix. Yeah. At cubic order, they will mix. But the claim is that uh, even if I put it in a loop, I will not induce a, a mass term. Uh, you could imagine something like this, zeta, uh, gamma, gamma, zeta, inducing a mass term quantum mechanically. But the claim is that uh, just because of this gauge symmetry, it, this term will give me nothing, nothing interesting. You just do some wave function renormalization or something. It can't induce a mass term. I don't know if I'm getting your question. Yeah. Okay. No, no, I'm solving for both of them. It's just that I'm writing the, their quadratic uh, Lagrangian separately. I mean, the... Ah, well, we can, but we haven't, uh, just, uh, just uh, observationally. <laughs> when, the other is, yeah, but the point is that this uh, coefficient difference generates difference in power. So we have seen one, so we know that there's more power deposited on this one than this one. And uh, it's the fact, it's essentially, once we measure this guy here, then we know this number. That's it. Okay. All right. Okay, so now I have to calculate the power spectrum. So I, I, I uh, discussed the, mode, the classical mode functions, but it shouldn't be hard to convince yourself that uh, because it's a free field theory, the power spectrum of any field phi k uh, eta phi k prime eta Uh, I'll just pick um, from the creation operator hits the right, the annihilation operator hits the left, I get one, so this should just be um, by classical k eta, by classical star prime. So with the classical mode functions, it's uh, trivial to see what the power spectrum is, okay? Um, one thing I didn't mention is that there is a delta function here, but this is not hard to believe. 
is just the fact that uh, the background has translation isometries. So you will get, in Minkowski space, we have a, a, a translation isometries in space and time. That's why we get a four-dimensional delta function. Here, we only have a spatial isometry, so we get a three-dimensional delta function. So I can only correlate uh, uh, modes of uh, same wavelength. So now the point is that uh, because the coefficients are different, the mode functions will be normalized differently. And uh, if I canonically normalize, it shouldn't take you more than a, a minute to see the following. So the, the zeta zeta power spectrum. So I'm going to strip this delta function because it's, uh, it, it's silly. We usually uh, put a prime in front of the correlation function just to identify that we stripped off the delta function. So I'm already using k and minus k here. So this is the this is the result. Uh, and this is gamma gamma k minus k. H squared uh, divided by K cubed M Planck squared, and there should be a factor of um, ah sorry, it should be a factor of eight here. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, this factor of eight. So this M Planck squared over eight is coming from here, and. Uh, the M Planck squared epsilon is here. Other than that, it's really, ah, let me, let me write it like this, 16 divided by two. So this, the H squared over two K cubed is the power spectrum of a massless scalar field in the sitter. And uh, these guys here are taking into account the, normal, the, the normalizations in front of the actions. So I'm just canonically normalizing the fields. That's why these uh, factors are appearing here. The extra factor of two has to do with polarization tensors. So never mind about it. It's just conventional. Okay? Uh, it's just that then the formula that I'm going to write down in a second uh, matches with what people usually quote in the literature. The point is that there is a difference in power between the, the gravitons and the scalars that is controlled by this low row parameter here. And because the slow, parameter, slow row parameter is small, it means that there is more power in the scalars than there is in the tensors. Okay? So there's nothing, I hope there's nothing mysterious about this formula. I just wrote down the power spectrum for a free field in the sitter space and I incorporated the prefactors in front of each of, the, each of the actions. But the prefactors are crucial because they explain, because epsilon is a small number, it makes this guy here much bigger than this one. And we have observed this, and we haven't observed this. So the smallness of this factor is what's being probed uh, the moment we measure gravitational waves. Now there, um, so let me first uh, write down, uh, because it's a number that is actually measured, this H. So uh, cosmologists, they prefer to strip off this uh, K cubed factor. So the power spectrum P zeta, which is more or less just stripping off this K cubed factor here, uh, it's related to the size of this coefficient. This is related to delta t over t squared, the CMB. And this is measured, was measured by Kobe. And this is a number measured with exquisite precision. Oh, it's nice. 
So the 10 to the minus 5 fluctuations in the CMB that people usually talk about are just the square root of this number. If you take the square root, it's like 4 point something times 10 to the minus 5. So this is being measured, which is nice. And this, well, we thought we measured a few years ago, but it turns out, unfortunately, we haven't. Um, but w instead of talking about the power in the gravitational waves, we usually refer to this thing R, the power in gravitational waves divided by the power in scalar fluctuations. And at the moment, this is constrained to be less than 0 0.07 at 95% confidence level. So uh, R, if you just plug in these formulas, R is 16 epsilon. So the smallness of this number has to do with the smallness of the slow roll parameter. Okay? So as we keep pushing this, uh, uh, this limit or make a detection, once we make the detection, we're going to learn about epsilon. But uh, most importantly, we're actually going to learn what is the ratio between the Hubble scale during inflation and the Planck mass. And that will tell us whether inflation happened at super huge scales or not so huge. And you'll give us uh, some new insight into the energy scale at which inflation occurred. Right now, we, we can't really probe this because we're measuring the ratio between the Hubble scale and not M Planck, but M Planck times root epsilon. Okay? So it's not, we're not there yet. Yeah, so I will. Next thing. One thing I haven't um, mentioned is the fact that this is inflation and not the sitter. So you have to take into account the fact that H and epsilon, they actually have some sm slow but small time, non-zero time dependence. And it, it, it means that this uh, K cubed de dependence is actually a little bit fake. So the, the amount of power deposited in each mode would be k, uh, 1 over k cubed if we were in pure de Sitter. But we're not in pure de Sitter. H has a time dependence. So it means that each mode, it, uh, when the particles are produced, each mode experiences a, a de Sitter space with slightly different value of the cosmological constant. So it means that the amount of power that is deposited in each mode is slightly different. Okay? So it's going to be k cubed plus a correction. So let me, the correction has the, uh, the eta parameter. And this has also been measured. So let me show you. And this is actually a very nice prediction of inflation. So let's, before I give you the, uh, I'm over time, right? So, and I'm going to finish lecture one now. So, <laughs> so uh, but let me make you the, the intuitive argument. So inflation tells me that, um, modes that exit the horizon first, they experience the beginning of the clock, so higher uh, power. And uh, modes that exit later, the inflaton has rolled down already, so they experience less power. So there should be a tilt. There should be less power deposited at, uh, at uh, shorter distance scales than at uh, longer distance scales. And uh, this is being measured by WMAP, in fact. So it's a nice prediction of inflation. And uh, the, the power spectrum with a k cubed was actually uh, conjectured, and people were using this to describe galaxy formation before inflation. It's called the Harrison-Zeldovich uh, power spectrum. But inflation predicts that it's not quite Harrison-Zeldovich, and it predicts that scalar fluctuations will be slightly red tilted because of this fact that the, the effective Hubble parameter is reducing. And this has been measured, which is fantastic. So let me just quote this for historical reasons. Um, yeah, so we don't say k, uh, k cubed, 1 over k cubed. We say k cubed plus uh, ns minus 1. So we write a number that is almost 1 minus 1. Uh, this is called the spectral index. And the tensors should also have a tilt. But okay, we haven't even measured 
We haven't even measured the tensor power spectrum, never mind the tilt. But let me just write it down. It's given by a simple formulas in terms of the slow row parameters. So ns minus one is minus two epsilon minus eta. So this is the eta parameter. And nt is minus two epsilon. And this has been measured. So, what, so unfortunately, because it depends on both epsilon and eta, we haven't learned the value of epsilon. So we know the value of this thing here. And um, yeah, we need to do more measurements to, to disentangle the different possibilities. So this has been measured. So let me quote you the number by W map, and I'll stop. Uh, oh, sorry, this is by Planck. This is by Planck. So WMAP saw this, but Planck saw it with like a, a more than five sigma. So it's 0.96 minus one plus or minus 0 0.01. So this is an observation, which is, which is amazing. So I would say that it's uh, more evidence that inflation is in the right track. So there is some intuition for, for why this, uh, sorry, NS minus one. For why this uh, power spec for why this power spectrum should have a slightly red tilt. Okay. About the tensors, I'll I'll get back to them at the end of um, next lecture. Before I finish, I just want to say what we'll do in our uh, next lecture. So I just described the free theory, just uh, two free fields. In the, in the end, after all of these. Uh, theoretical uh, constructions here. I landed uh, at uh, the Lagrangians of two free fields in quasi de Sitter space. And uh, so I first assume that I'm really in pure de Sitter, and they, then I take into account the fact that these guys have some slow momentum dependence. And that's where these uh, NS minus one and NT are coming from. They're coming from the time evolution of both H and epsilon. So I get different answers for the scalar and for the tensor because here I have to take into account that H is evolving with time as each mode crosses the horizon. It experiences a different value of the Hubble constant. But for the scalars, both H and epsilon change. So that's why I don't get the, the same answer. The time evolution of epsilon is giving me the, the extra factor of eta here. Uh, and this has been measured. So the scalar power spectrum is essentially pinned down. Everything else is not. And uh, it's amazing that somehow just this is enough to describe almost everything we see. Just a free field in quasi de Sitter space is enough to describe structure formation and, and uh, galaxy clustering and so on, and the CMB fluctuations. So uh, yeah, let me stop here.